Hello, and welcome to the Kubernetes Code of Conduct Committee talk. I'm sure it has a title, which I absolutely do not remember. <laughs> Somebody want to tell me what this title, what this panel is called? No, you did it as perfect. That was great. Yeah. Yeah. Hunk. So, we have a lot of ground to cover here. And the first thing I would actually really love, because we have so many delightful panelists, is if, yes, I am going to do the thing where I ask everyone to talk. Aww. Starting with Jason, please introduce yourself and tell us what your, uh, your interest slash role slash um, most exciting violation that you've considered and <laughs> not doing it is. So, <laughs> so my name is Jason DeTiberis. Uh, I am currently employed by Cisco in the open source program office and uh, previously been a contributed through various SIGs within the Kubernetes community and have uh, recently uh, joined the Code of Conduct board within the last uh, six months, I think, is about when it was. Um, but I was really interested in joining the uh, Code of Conduct committee uh, because um, I've seen how wonderful and diverse this community is. And, and even as great as the community has been, there have still been issues that have driven away some really great, brilliant, and talented, and wonderful people from this project. And I wanted to help ensure that we have a space that is safe for all and allows our project to actually be better by welcoming people to the table and giving them a chance to flourish. Thank you, Jason, and you answered that much better than I asked it, so I would love to hear why everyone wants to work on this. Hi, uh, my name is Jeremy Rickard. I'm in, currently employed by Microsoft Azure. Uh, I'm also a chair in SIG release, so you've probably seen emails from me for releasey things as well. Um, I think very similarly to what Jason said, I was really drawn to serve on the committee um, to help make the project a safe space. I think that uh, it is pretty welcoming. I think, um, in general, I think it's a it's a great place to be. It's very welcoming. It's a, a place where people can come and do their their best. Uh, and they can contribute um, to the greater success of the project. But uh, it's definitely necessary for us to all kind of internalize the code of conduct and make sure that we are living by the values that the the project. Um, is driven by. And I think that just being drawn to the committee was just me wanting to give back as well. Hey, <laughs> uh, I'm Danielle. Uh, I currently work on WebAssembly stuff at Fermion, uh, but in the project, I'm one of the leads for the Signode testing subproject. Um, and work across sort of Signode, SIG testing, and a bit of Kate's infra. Um, I joined because as great as the community has been, I want to make sure it stays that way, uh, especially as, you know, Jason pointed out, like, there are people who've been pushed away, like good friends of mine, and I want to make sure that I don't get pushed out, but also that, you know, more people like me don't. Um, hi. I'm Tillery. I work at Red Hat. Um, um, let me see. I don't. I'm so. Uh, I'm, I'm in the community, but you wouldn't have seen my name outside of the outside of the committee. Really, it's a lot of sometimes talking to people and helping, like more on the sidelines. I'm like the worst contributor ever in that way. Um, She's not. <laughs> he's so nice to me. Anyway. Um, but so I joined the committee because um, it is the yeah the the community is very open. It's it's very it's it's typically very welcoming. Um, but uh, what I care about is that we have good relationships with each other, um, and I think that this committee's a really big part of it is helping us to maintain those good relationships. Sometimes heal those relationships when there has been damage, um, and that having that type of relationship and, and, and you know that type of sense of belonging that we want everybody to experience um, is something that should be like of the utmost priority for an open source community. So that was why I joined. I'm 
Xander. I, uh, I'm an open source. Oh, there we go. Hi, I'm Xander. I'm an open source product manager at Microsoft. Um, and uh, most recently, I guess with the project, I was the release lead for Kubernetes 1.27, which came out last week. Um, yeah, hope y'all had a chance to try it. Sorry about that regression right away. Mm -hmm. um, I think looking back on why I joined, um, a lot of people in my life and like around me are like, oh, Xander really likes Kubernetes. And, and that's actually not particularly true. I kind of hate computers. Um, <laughs> and, and Kubernetes is not exempt from that. Why I'm here and what drew me in is this community of people, of, of wonderful humans. And I felt welcome right away. And I think that's very easy for people that look like me. And I want to make sure that that same warm, welcoming feeling that I got from the community is extended to people that do not look like me as well. Very well put. Thank you. And thank you all. Um, so now that we've gotten the chance to get to know our, uh, our panelists a little bit, um, let's uh, talk about you know, a few questions from the community, like starting with, hmm, what happens when someone files a code of conduct report? Um, I'm not necessarily going to point to anyone in particular, uh, but who would like to uh, give us just the TLDR, the 10,000 foot view, what happens? Yeah, I, I can start. Not it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so there are several ways that people can report incidents or concerns. Um, they can report them to the, the conduct distribution list. Uh, they can also reach out directly to members of the Kubernetes Code of Conduct Committee. Um, once that happens, we start kind of tracking that incident. We do some background research. We will talk to folks involved, try to gather information so that we can get a kind of a complete picture of what's going on. Um, a lot of it is talking to people and a lot of it is, you know, really trying to understand the situation and trying to figure out what the best path forward is to, to mend relationships and to um, restore trust, restore relationships um, and, and find an outcome that will heal that that incident yeah and i think there's uh, sometimes a misconception that the code of conduct committee is here to assess blame mm -hmm. and punish somebody and that's not what we're really here to do what we're trying to do when we reach out to folks after somebody submitted a complaint is we want to find out what happens you know just because somebody filed a complaint it could be anything from a misunderstanding uh, over text in a PR. It could be cultural differences with how somebody, you know, uh, somebody could say something short and, and they meant it well intentioned, but it came off as, as something that, you know, hurt somebody's feelings. And, and we try to get to the bottom of what the issue is so that we can try to help all of those involved understand a little bit better. Because at the end of the day, the project really is about people and, and people interacting. and. And our job is to figure out where things are going wrong. In, in, in a lot of cases, it's just, please make sure that you expand a little bit more when you have a reply or you're closing out a PR and not just say, I'm closing this and, and close it. You know, say the reason why you're closing it and, and just spend a little bit more time on your reply uh, because, you know, a new contributor is not going to know that, you know, you're super busy and you know, don't really have the time to, to spend on a proper review. But at the same time, you know, sometimes we do have to get involved in difficult decisions where, um, you know, it, it impacts the safety or the comfort of people within the community. And we need to make sure and work with the proper groups to try to address those issues in a way. And, and even with those issues, the first answer isn't necessarily to like try to get somebody booted from the community. It's like, you know, trying to explain to them why what they're doing is wrong, how we can help them address it, maybe point them towards uh, some training that they can take to better understand the issues and try to 
like you said, you know, try to restore the community. I think, sorry. <clears throat> I think one of the things that we struggle with sometimes as well, because we are an international community and we're dealing with layers of translation and some of that is automated translation, right? Google Translate will, will change somebody's words. So, so what we've literally had to find people to help us read things in the original language to understand the form and function of the comment. And if it was written the way it was you know, made to come across, and so, you know, it's one of those things where um, we really have to be very, like, just walk into every situation with uh, zero assumptions. Um, otherwise, you know, we wouldn't be able to holistically understand all of the little pieces that would maybe build up into a situation that causes a report. Um, and a lot of times it's, it's like almost forensic. Mm -hmm. Where did this go wrong exactly? Like, what was that point where we went off the rails? Um, and it's, some of it is like human error, and some of it's computer error. Yeah, like, yeah, especially when uh, we're dealing with issues of community management, mm -hmm. um, you've got to sort of go into all of them with, you know, we know a lot of the people in the community, but if we go into a report, it's not about our friendships with them. It's not about how we know them. We have to go in and understand both their perspective and understanding and whoever else is involved. So like if it's a new contributor coming in who has a bad experience or an existing contributor who has a bad time for some reason, like it's a lot of sort of work to sort of detach yourself, go and understand, do research, and then help bring things back and restore sort of trust. Like we never really seek to do anything punitive because that's not how this community works. And if we needed to, it would be something very serious. I think just to add a little bit onto what everybody said, like you know, covered it pretty well. Um, when we reach out to do investigations, when we receive a report, I think um, often people kind of tend to view it as like the cops knocking at their door. And um, through an investigation process and when we're thinking about action to take, we are always looking for restorative action. There's, there's a big difference between restorative and punitive action. And this body is always looking for a way that we can take restorative action on incidents that are reported. Now, it, there are circumstances that would warrant different actions, but we are always looking for that that restorative act. So that's that's encouraging from the point of view of somebody who might be a community member wondering how is it going to be handled if I finally. Uh, yeah, uh, people reach out to, I think, all of us all of the time with like a, hey, this thing was a bit weird, or like, I didn't feel great about this. And then we can sort of help talk someone through it and understand if, you know, it's a thing they want to want us to help them with, or whether it's something that, um, you know, they want to leave alone. Uh, I've like uh, helped preemptively go into like various meetings uh, just to be around um, in a when someone was unsure and they just wanted a second opinion. Like with that to do that. Yeah, and I would say if you're not sure, default to yes, uh, because we will help you determine if it was or wasn't. And worse comes to worse, we have a discussion to try to make sure that other people don't have that same question. And, and I know that folks have expressed to me in the past that they're worried about adding additional workload to folks that are already busy. And yes, we, we are busy people, both with our day jobs and the community and everything. But the most important thing, I think, to all of us is that we make sure that this community stays welcoming and, and friendly to all. So I know myself, I would rather take the time to investigate something that turns out to be nothing 
because sometimes those things build up over time. And what happens is if, if we don't address it early on, then those, those feelings kind of fester and it becomes a much bigger issue that could really potentially result in a serious COC violation down the road because, yep. Yeah. Just waiting until you were done. Oh, no, feel free. Oh, okay. As I say, like building off of that, you should, you, you know what you have experienced, but we know what the community is seeing. So if you're like, huh, that was kind of maybe iffy, if you, you should definitely come and talk to us. One, there's no consequences for making a report that we discover is not really actionable or we don't think that there's anything for us to do with. Like, there's no consequences. It just is a thing. Uh, spend a few minutes, no big deal, right? Like I said, we'd much rather do that and than not. But the other thing is, is, it's probably not just you. It might be five or six other people or you know, two other people are like, and there could even be potentially a history there that we as this body would be aware of. And so as we're working through things, if somebody starts displaying consistent behaviors that might not be like, oh God, those are terrible, but are kind of like, ooh, that's a little cringe, you know, consistently, then that sets us up to know we need to have a conversation with this person, help them to have a better relationship with the community at large, because even and very likely true, if they're unintentionally alienating other people, then they're going to start receiving alienation as well, right? You're gonna start getting ostracized if you have bad people skills. And we don't want that either. And so it's sometimes like a, a series of, um, what's that turn of phrase I'm looking for? Like a, like a, just a bunch of little missteps that can add up. And so like we said, we're, we're trying to be like, restorative or about relationships and helping people to have good relationships with each other. And so in a completely like non-punitive way, we can start going to people and letting them know, hey, uh, you might not be aware of this, but you're coming across really short kind of often. Is there something going on? Are you like feeling really stressed out? Is there something that we can do to help you or even just help you practice, um, you know, how to have a little bit of a better communication style? And like adding to that, um, what can be a 30 second conversation with someone when they start doing something can stop from turning into something that is a huge amount of effort for everyone like six months later. Like, and we're happy to go and say, hey, like your communication style isn't really working. Like, can you do something about it? I think uh, just real quick, short and sweet, I guess, yeah. If you're ever unsure about something, feel free to reach out to any one of us directly or file a report. Um, if you're not comfortable doing that, you can file an anonymous report too, just to say we are here to meet you wherever you're at on, you know, in that process. Yeah, and I was just going to say the other thing too is anything that you report and the discussions that we have default to confidential unless you agree otherwise. So even just bringing something up, you don't have to worry about it potentially, you know, being like we all have agreed to, you know, keep confidentially confidentiality around all of these things. And that's actually a really good point. And that brings me to the question of it's it's great that you're saying, okay, so these, you know, five people are maybe the only ones who are gonna see this report I filed. Even if it's anonymous, maybe if the person I'm complaining about ever sees it, they will 100% know it's me. Exactly like, who is the info shared with? So in the process of filing a report, um, we will explicitly seek the reporter's consent for any single piece of information shared with anyone outside this group of people. If in the process of speaking to somebody, it would be very apparent who was reporting. We will have your consent before taking any action on that. There is, there is no circumstance under which any information would be shared with anyone without your explicit consent. Yeah, I think I can speak for everybody here where I think we would all resign over ever doing anything like that. Like, as in, like, even if something ended up being outside of our jurisdiction and needed to be escalated further up inside the Linux Foundation or whatever, like, we don't even mention it 
to their staff before we talk to you. Um, like, we just do not. And also, if we get to the point that we actually start filing a report for an actual in-depth investigation, uh, those documents are created under a uh, shared Google Drive with very limited access. Um, so um, I think outside of a few people outside of the Code of Conduct Committee, and I'm sure one of you can uh, expand on that, but we, we are the group that has access to it, and we even anonymize the folders and, so, and the document names so that the audit logs don't reveal any information about the reports. Yeah, uh, so when it comes to access to the actual data, it is just this group. Um, there's two members of the steering committee and I think one person at the CNCF who can see metadata, which is to say document titles, which is why we anonymize them. Um, and anything else would have to go through a public PR to elevate access. Um, the other thing with that, you know, form and function of the uh, anonymity is if it would be required that we would reveal some sort of information about you in your report in order to have those conversations and you don't want that to go forward, that's fine. That's totally okay, right? That's. It, only what you absolutely consent to is what we're going to do. But it still helps us to make more informed recommendations if there is a future incident involving that same person in another report. Because we can say, oh, they seem to have a bit of a history here. Maybe they would benefit from some sort of, there's these great trainings that we could recommend for them. Or maybe they could get a mentor or some coaching. And we can make a more informed recommendation while still completely protecting you, your report, and that history. Right. Well, that, that's great to hear. And that kind of leads to the next question of um, how does the committee uh, approach actions in response to a reported instance? Because you're, you're mentioning these possible future actions. Like, can you walk us through what that process looks like? I mean, we talk about them as a group, <laughs> <laughs> right? Um, so we have, uh, well, like, I don't know, we, we see a report come in and we have a, a private Slack channel where we'll be like, there's been a report and then we all go look at the report and then we say, okay, when can we have a meeting about this? Is it, you know, if it's a Tuesday and our regular meetings is a Wednesday, we probably will just wait until that Wednesday. But if it's Wednesday after our meeting, realistically, we're going to schedule an ad hoc meeting to come together and talk about that report. And then there's an also a really important piece in there, and I've actually had to do this, um, where we have to make a decision to recuse or not as well. So when you know people well, when you work with them, um, and there's a report made involving that, then you have to make the decision like, hey, I don't even want to give the appearance of bias here or impropriety, even if I know I can be completely neutral here. So I'm going to choose to recuse. There's four other people besides me on this committee who are perfectly capable of handling this. And that way, you know, I know that there's just, I've done my level best to, to preserve the integrity of this body. Uh, and on that, there's like sort of two levels of recusing yourself. There's a, I don't want to be involved in this situation because I know these people and it would be awkward. And then there's the, I cannot be part of this because, you know, we have a reporting relationship at work or something. And for the first one, like, you can be asked to come back if, you know, your relationship can help resolve a problem. Um, but it's something we try to avoid. But, you know, it's a community where we know people. And sometimes you have to rely on knowing people to build that trust, especially because, you know, we're not exactly a very easily transparent body by nature of what we do, uh, which is part of why we want to do things like this to talk about how we work. I think um, it's kind of been touched on throughout this, but um, uh, when we do think about actions that we take in response to incidents, 90% of the time, that action is um, something similar to working with a party to help them understand that their communication style is coming across as harsh or um, uh, facilitating a conversation that would result in an apology or, or just, you know, general relationship management and, and communication coaching, like that, when, when we say action in response to an incident, 
that is typically the action because that is the bulk of the incidents that, that come in. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's almost always a conversation and a like, you know, explaining that, you know, we understand that things are hard, but like people have boundaries and you need to respect them. And like, here is how we can help you do that. And like, sometimes it's like, here is how we can help you improve your governance to stop this happening again. Well, I think it's important to point out too that we actually don't have the power to do anything drastic like remove somebody from the community. If we think that a situation arises to that level, then our action is basically to make a recommendation to the steering committee or the CNCF or the LF to address that issue. It's not a, like that's not under our authority to do anything. Our authority pretty much ends at, you know, we can recommend that this, you know, thread be locked and stop this conversation, have conversations with people or, you know, you know, basically a slap on the wrist and like, let's kind of do better. I do think there is one particular piece of nuance to that, though, that I want to make sure we catch. Um, it, while it, it may seem a little awkward in how it's structured, we do not report to the steering committee. Were a report to be filed against a member of the steering committee, as unfortunate as that would be, we could handle, like, that is, that is, we could take that report. Um, we are elected by steering, but we do not have a reporting relationship with that committee. I just want to make that clear. And right. we're not exempt from the code of conduct either. And like, while the steering committee owns sort of like technical and, um, like structural stuff, we own a lot of the sort of community support uh, for the community. And like, you know, as much as like the way our punitive power, if we needed to use it, is a bit awkward, it exists if we need it to. Um, the, the question that immediately comes to mind, and I'm gonna go off script here for a minute because I'm thinking, well, wait a minute, so you, could make sure that the steering committee does the right thing, or you could make sure each other do the right thing. The code of conduct applies to everyone, but what happens if someone who's new to the community and doesn't feel like anyone knows who they are, wants to talk to someone about one of you or me or steering or someone who they think has a lot of visibility? Like, what, is it, is it okay to complain about the, who watches the watchers? <laughs> so, I mean, I can only easily speak for myself, uh, but if someone was to raise something to me about the rest of steering, uh, that would then become a sort of sidebar mm -hmm. conversation between the remaining members uh, to figure out if the problem was with the body as a whole, that would be a conversation with steering. Um, and I think steering has the same policy for themselves. I was just going to say the uh, CNCF also has a working group working on a code of conduct committee of their own and an interim code of conduct committee. And if you feel that, you know, it's somebody that has too much influence within the Kubernetes community, that is a place to go. That's, that's comforting just because I think any community member who feels like, I can't complain about X. Yes, you can. You absolutely can. You will be listened to. Um, and that kind of also brings us to the code of conduct, um, you know, as written, because it is written in human language, um, can at times be vague. Could be open to interpretation. Um, how does that affect your committee's decisions, decision process on reported incidents? If somebody would like to uh, give you some rules lawyer on your person. Uh, it had to be a Oh, God. <laughs> do, do you want me to take it? Okay, so I'll start on this one. And I, I'd say that it is intentionally vague mm -hmm. because not every situation is the same and not every interaction is the same. You know, if two parties are consenting in a conversation, then you know, it may sound different than two strangers talking and, and the interaction, you know, may be inappropriate with that consent and not be appropriate in another situation. So we try to really look at the situation. Has harm been done? 
that is the big key. If there has been harm that is done, then that's the key to, is this something that we need to investigate further? Yeah, like programmers really love rules because it turns out when you teach a machine to think, it thinks exactly how you tell it to. And sometimes it's easy for us to forget that humans are not computers following a predefined set of rules. And that means that unless you were going to like, you know, write something on the scale of the law, which even then is up to interpretation, like there's always going to be some level of ambiguity. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's more about the ethos of what the document is trying to represent than the specific words within it. That's what really frustrates me about rule lawyers, because I'm like, no, no, you get the gist. Like, mm -hmm. I think when we're dealing with a situation of ambiguity, um, and this I don't think is mentioned in the document, but when we are looking at a situation with ambiguity, one of the first things that we're always going to look to is power dynamics. Yeah. Um, and that, that really goes a long way in helping us move through ambiguous situations. Well, and I think you also have situations in which people might try to leverage the code of conduct against somebody in a way that um, they bait somebody. You know, they, they specifically target a person and attack them and attack them, trying to skirt the letter of what's on paper, and they try to evoke a reaction that crosses the line. And that type of weaponization of the COC is also something that we keep in mind as well. You know, is this being so done somebody against somebody that is marginalized in the community? And, you know, we need to look in the situation more holistically than just the one aspect of the interaction that resulted in the report. Yeah, it's, it really is almost forensic in its nature. Um, and I wanted to say that uh, the you know, the other thing uh, we have to look into is sometimes we're getting reports from people who are seeing public conversations. Mm -hmm. So they weren't part of the conversation, but they see it and they think, ooh, this might, might be a problem. And so then, you know, talking to the parties involved in that, and it could be that, yeah, that communication looks very brusque, but those are two very brusque people and they're both perfectly fine. And actually that looks, that's what their healthy communication looks like, right? And it's still always important to remind people to, you know, you have a much wider audience sometimes than just the two of you. Um, but that, that also kind of plays into it as, as well because of the, the way we're communicating with each other is usually very publicly and in writing within the community that sometimes it's actually not people directly involved in the situation that resulted in a report. But please do report those issues. Yes. If you see them, we would rather take a look at something that is a non-issue than something that somebody maybe didn't feel comfortable raising because a lot of times people from marginalized communities don't feel comfortable, you know, especially if they're new to the community, you know, raising those types of issues. And sometimes it's a case of behavior that like might be normal to an in-group but can keep people out. And then we need to have a conversation that's like, you know, the conference circle. You open up a circle so people can join. The same applies to open source. Like if you're cliquey and uncomfortable, like there's something that needs to be done if you want to survive. We, we're just about out of time, so I'm going to um, do the go down the line one more time. I'll start with Andrew this time. Give us your best tip to have people help people uh, interact well in the community with the, uh, with the committee or just each other. We say it at the beginning of every Kubernetes meeting: be excellent to each other. Um, and uh, recognize that um, a lot of our interactions take place online, mm -hmm. and um, it can be it can talk to determine tone and things like that. So just be kind. Um, and I'll also just add thank you for coming to this session. Um, it the, the window before booth crawl in this very far out <laughs> room, and I know it's not the most exciting topic. So really thank you for being here. I I have my own. I got it. <laughs> I'm good. <laughs> um, yeah, I think that the, you know, keep, keep, keep in mind the energy of, of being a welcoming space and, and try to always put that foot forward, right? Kindness costs zero, it's, it's free. So we're as much as possible. And you know what, you don't actually owe anybody an instantaneous response. 
If you can't be your very best in that moment, don't do it right then. Yep. You can act, it's okay. It's, no, no houses will burn down if you don't respond to that PR when you're super stressed out and spread thin. It, if you want to just say, I, I see this, I acknowledge it, and I have to come back to this later, that is like perfect. That way somebody knows that there's eyes, but you just can't be there, or it's a comment. Same thing, right? Do it when you can be your best, and if you can't, at, and let people know you've seen it and that you will try your best later. Uh, mine is, uh, you know, we come from all over the place with different backgrounds, different experiences. But as long as you, you know, respect people and their right to, like, be themselves, you can overcome basically anything. Like, any disagreement, as long as you, you know, treat each other as equals, you'll figure it out. It's computers. They're not that hard. <laughs> it's magic sand we taught to think. It's fine. <laughs> yeah, I think... Everybody has made super great points. I think r relationships are what drive all of this. Uh, it's what makes things successful. And I think treating people with respect needs to be your default mode of operation. So when you're having an interaction with someone, treat them with respect and go into that with positive intent. And hopefully good things come from that. And if good things don't come from that, we'll find a way to try to get back to good things. And I think for me, I'm not gonna say what first came to my mind because I realize it comes from a very privileged position. And initially I was going to say, assume positive intent. And for somebody like me, that's easy to do. Mm -hmm. But there's a lot of people in this community that have to deal with offhand comments and um, kind of underhanded jabs from people that build up over time. And I don't want to tell those people to assume positive intent. Instead, I will say, try to be empathetic to the person on the other end. You know, if it's somebody submitting a PR to your repository and, you know, it's, you know, completely wrong, like they, you know, they, they made a mistake, try to be empathetic to that, you know. I know we all have a little bit to do, but take the time to just reply to that person, even if you're busy, or wait till you have the time. Um, you know, if you're on the other end of that, you know, try to make sure that you're at least telling the person why. It's so moving and so powerful. Thank you all so much, um, and uh, keep up the good work. Thanks. And thank you, Bridget.